The first time Lisa came home in silence, Nina didn't think much of it. After all, moving to a new neighborhood and starting a new school was a big change for any child. Lisa was always a bright, talkative girl, but perhaps she just needed time to adjust. That's what Nina told herself as she watched her daughter silently eat her snack that afternoon. She had no idea that the first small crack was already showing, but the silence continued over the following weeks. Lisa stopped sharing the stories of her day with her usual enthusiasm. Her once constant chatter about school, friends, and playground games had faded into single-word answers. How was school, sweetie? Nina would ask. Fine, Lisa would mutter, eyes fixed on her plate or the floor. The shift was subtle but unmistakable. Nina's heart tightened every time she heard her daughter's muted response. One afternoon, as Nina was unpacking boxes in their new house, she caught a glimpse of Lisa standing at the window, staring out at the empty street. Her small shoulders slumped, as if carrying a burden Nina couldn't yet understand. Are you okay, sweetheart? Nina asked, gently stroking her daughter's hair. Lisa nodded without looking up, her fingers tracing patterns on the glass. Something was wrong. Nina could feel it. But how could she reach her daughter if Lisa wouldn't open up? That night, after tucking Lisa into bed, Nina lay awake beside her husband, Malcolm, her mind racing. Do you think she's having trouble adjusting? Nina asked in a whisper, hoping Malcolm might offer some reassurance. He sighed, rolling over to face her. It's a big change, Nina. Give her some time. But as the days passed, Nina couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to Lisa's silence than just a new school or new friends. Something deeper was unsettling her child. Nina's intuition only grew stronger. Mothers have a way of sensing when something is off with their children, even when words go unspoken. It wasn't just the silence that bothered her now. It was the way Lisa seemed to shrink into herself more each day. She noticed how her daughter flinched when she heard the sound of the bus pulling up to their street each morning. Her once bubbly girl now walked to the bus stop as if heading towards something she dreaded. One particular morning, Nina stood by the window, watching as Lisa boarded the yellow bus. She noticed the way Lisa hesitated at the bottom step, glancing back at the house before climbing aboard. The bus driver, Mr. Harris, waved his usual indifferent wave, his face hidden beneath his cap. Nina's stomach twisted in knots as she watched the bus disappear down the road. Something was happening on that bus. She felt it in her bones. That afternoon, when Lisa returned home, Nina tried again. How was the bus ride today, sweetheart? She asked, kneeling down to meet her daughter's eyes. Lisa shrugged, avoiding her gaze. It was fine, Mom, just like always. But there was a tremble in her voice, barely noticeable, but enough to send alarm bells ringing in Nina's mind. You can always talk to me. You know that, right? Nina said softly. Lisa nodded, but her silence was louder than any words. That night, as Nina lay in bed, she stared at the ceiling, her mind swirling with questions. Could it be bullying? Maybe some of the other kids were giving Lisa a hard time. But no, Lisa would have told her, wouldn't she? No, this was something else, something darker. And Nina wasn't going to rest until she found out what it was. Moving to a predominantly white neighborhood was supposed to be a fresh start for the family. It was supposed to offer better opportunities for Lisa, a safer environment, good schools, and a sense of community. But now, as Nina drove through the tree-lined streets, she couldn't help but notice the stares they received from the neighbors. They were polite enough, but distant, their smiles never quite reaching their eyes. Something felt off. On their first day in the new house, Nina had been excited. She remembered standing on the front lawn with Malcolm and Lisa, waving at a few neighbors who passed by. We're going to love it here, she had told herself, full of hope. But over time, the subtle differences became impossible to ignore. The other parents at the bus stop barely acknowledged Nina, their conversations stopping as soon as she arrived. It was as if they were outsiders, unwelcome in this quiet, picture-perfect world. The isolation was subtle but suffocating. Nina tried to connect, inviting neighbors over for coffee or offering to help with community events. But the invitations were always politely declined. Malcolm, focused on his new job, reassured her that things would improve over time. But Nina wasn't so sure. There was a barrier between them and this new community, and it seemed impenetrable. 
And now, with Lisa's growing silence and the strange way she seemed to dread the bus ride, Nina couldn't help but wonder if this neighborhood wasn't as welcoming as it first appeared. The stares, the whispered conversations, was it all connected? Were they truly safe here? Determined to get to the bottom of what was happening, Nina decided to ask Lisa more directly about the bus. Lisa, she began gently one evening, as they sat at the dinner table, I noticed you've been quiet lately. Is everything okay on the bus? Malcolm glanced up from his plate, his brow furrowing at the question. Lisa paused mid-bite, her fork hovering in the air. Her eyes darted between her parents before she quickly looked down at her plate. It's fine, Mom, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Just school stuff. But Nina didn't believe her. There was a tension in the air, thick and heavy, and Lisa's avoidance only made it worse. School stuff like what? Nina pressed, trying to keep her voice light. Lisa shrugged, pushing her food around her plate. Nothing, really. Can we just talk about something else? Malcolm reached over and placed a hand on Nina's arm, giving her a gentle squeeze. Let's not push, Nina, he said quietly. But Nina wasn't ready to let it go. Something was wrong. She could feel it. The way Lisa avoided eye contact, the way she seemed to fold into herself whenever the bus was mentioned. There was more to this than school stuff. But how could Nina help if Lisa wouldn't tell her? After dinner, Nina and Malcolm sat together in the living room, the silence between them heavy. I don't want to push her, Nina said finally, but I know something's going on. What if it's serious? Malcolm sighed, running a hand through his hair. We'll keep an eye on her, he said. She'll come to us when she's ready. But Nina wasn't so sure. What if by then it was too late? The following days brought little relief to Nina's worries. Every time Lisa left for school, Nina felt a tightening in her chest. She would watch from the window as her daughter boarded the bus, always with the same hesitant glance back at the house. The more Nina observed, the more she noticed small, unsettling changes. Lisa no longer wanted to play outside after school, and when she came home, she would head straight to her room without a word. At dinner, Lisa's responses became even shorter. Her once animated stories replaced with vague, distracted comments. Nina began to feel powerless, trapped in the silence of her own home. She had always been able to read her daughter like a book, but now it was as though Lisa had put up an invisible wall, and Nina couldn't find a way through. The change was subtle, but to a mother, it was unmistakable. One afternoon after another quiet dinner, Nina found herself staring out the window, her thoughts swirling. What are we missing? she whispered to herself, her gaze fixed on the empty street where the yellow bus would soon appear. Malcolm, who had been reading a report for work, glanced up at her. You're still thinking about the bus, aren't you? he asked softly. Nina nodded, unable to shake the feeling that something terrible was happening, just out of reach. We've tried talking to her, Malcolm, but she won't tell us what's going on. Malcolm stood up and wrapped his arms around her from behind, his voice gentle but firm. Give it time, Nina. We'll get through to her. Maybe it's just a phase. But Nina couldn't help but feel that time wasn't on their side. What if there was something happening on that bus that Lisa was too afraid to talk about? As Nina's worry deepened, she decided to trust her instincts. She knew Lisa wasn't going to open up on her own, and waiting for things to change was no longer an option. One morning, after dropping Lisa at the bus stop and watching the bus disappear around the corner, Nina grabbed her keys and followed in her car. She kept her distance, her heart racing as she trailed the yellow bus through the familiar streets. She wasn't entirely sure what she was looking for, but she couldn't sit back any longer. As she drove, she watched the bus make its stops, picking up children along the way. Everything seemed normal at first. The bus driver, Mr. Harris, greeted each child with a polite nod, and the kids chatted amongst themselves as they climbed aboard. But when Lisa stepped onto the bus, Nina noticed something. Mr. Harris's demeanor shifted. His nod was colder, his eyes lingering a little too long. It was a small detail, something Nina wouldn't have noticed if she hadn't been watching closely. But now that she had, the unease in her stomach grew. She followed the bus all the way to school, parking across the street as the children filed off. Again, Mr. Harris's treatment of Lisa was different. He barely looked at the other kids, but his gaze followed Lisa as she walked to the school doors. There was something about the way he watched her that made Nina's skin crawl. 
That night, as she lay in bed, Nina couldn't stop thinking about what she had seen. It wasn't enough to confront Mr. Harris or take action, but it confirmed her worst fears. Something was happening. Something that Lisa hadn't been able to tell her. And if Nina didn't do something soon, she feared it might get worse. The following morning, Nina woke with a new sense of purpose. She couldn't shake the image of Mr. Harris watching Lisa with that unsettling look. She had to find out what was really going on, but she also knew she needed to be careful. Confronting Lisa too aggressively might cause her to shut down even more. So she decided to approach things differently. As they prepared breakfast, Nina casually asked Lisa about her bus ride again, but this time she focused on the other kids. Do you sit with anyone on the bus, sweetie? She asked as she poured cereal into a bowl. Lisa hesitated for a moment before shrugging. Not really. I just sit by myself most days. Nina's heart sank. Why was her daughter, who used to make friends so easily, now sitting alone every day? Is there a reason you don't sit with the other kids? Nina pressed, keeping her tone light. Lisa didn't meet her mother's eyes. No, I just... I like being alone sometimes, she said softly, pushing her cereal around with her spoon. Nina glanced over at Malcolm, who was reading the news on his phone. He caught her eye and gave her a reassuring nod, but Nina wasn't reassured. What about the bus driver? Does he say anything to you? Nina asked, her voice barely a whisper. For the first time, Lisa looked up, her eyes wide with fear. No, Mom. Can we talk about something else? The way Lisa quickly changed the subject sent a chill down Nina's spine. Her daughter was hiding something, and whatever it was, it scared her. But before Nina could press further, Lisa grabbed her backpack and announced that she was going to wait for the bus outside. Nina watched as she left the house, her heart heavy with the weight of her unanswered questions. Something wasn't right, and whatever it was, Nina was determined to uncover it. As the days passed, Nina's concern grew stronger. She noticed Lisa's fear in the small moments, the way her eyes would dart nervously toward the bus stop as they ate breakfast, the way her hands would tremble slightly when it was time to leave for school. It was as if Lisa was living in constant fear, and Nina couldn't bear to see it. But no matter how many times she tried to talk to her daughter, Lisa remained silent. One afternoon after school, Nina decided to approach things differently. She sat with Lisa on the couch, pulling her daughter close. Lisa, sweetheart, I know something's bothering you, she began gently. You don't have to be afraid to talk to me. I'm your mom, and I'll always be here to protect you. Lisa looked up at her mother, her eyes filled with a mix of fear and shame. For a moment, Nina thought she was finally going to open up. But then, just as quickly as the vulnerability appeared, it vanished. Lisa pulled away, shaking her head. It's nothing, Mom. Really. I'm fine, she insisted, her voice cracking slightly. Nina's heart broke at the sight of her daughter withdrawing further into herself. She wanted so badly to take away whatever pain Lisa was carrying, but how could she if her daughter wouldn't share it with her? That night, after Lisa had gone to bed, Nina sat at the kitchen table, her mind racing. She felt like she was on the edge of discovering something important but the pieces of the puzzle just weren't fitting together. What was happening to Lisa? Why was she so afraid? And why wouldn't she let her own mother help her? Nina knew she had to do something, but she wasn't sure what. All she knew was that she couldn't stand by and watch her daughter suffer in silence any longer. The next morning, Nina couldn't bear the silence any longer. As she sat across from Lisa at the breakfast table, watching her daughter quietly poke at her food, something inside her snapped. Lisa, she said, her voice firm but soft. I need you to tell me what's going on. Lisa froze, her spoon hovering over her bowl, her eyes flicking up to meet her mother's. The fear that crossed her face broke Nina's heart, but she couldn't let this go on. Not anymore. I know something's wrong on the bus, Nina continued, leaning forward. You don't have to be afraid, sweetheart. I'm here for you, and I will protect you. But I need you to trust me. For a moment, Lisa seemed on the verge of speaking. Her eyes glistened with unshed tears, and her lips parted as if to say something. But then, just as quickly, she closed her mouth and looked away, shaking her head. It's nothing, Mom. I'm fine, she whispered. Nina reached across the table, taking Lisa's small hand in hers. Please, baby, she said, her voice breaking. I know you're not fine, 
I see it in the way you've been acting. I see it in your eyes every day when you come home. Whatever it is, you don't have to deal with it alone. But Lisa pulled her hand away, standing up from the table. I have to go. The bus will be here soon, she mumbled, grabbing her backpack and heading for the door. As Nina watched Lisa walk out, her heart ached. The silence was suffocating. How could she protect her daughter if she couldn't even reach her? Malcolm, who had been quietly listening from the kitchen doorway, stepped forward, placing a hand on Nina's shoulder. She'll talk when she's ready, he said gently. But Nina wasn't so sure. How much longer could Lisa carry this burden before it broke her? Determined to find out the truth, Nina decided to take matters into her own hands. The following day, instead of staying home after Lisa left for school, she grabbed her car keys and quietly followed the yellow school bus. Her hands gripped the steering wheel tightly, her heart pounding in her chest as she kept a safe distance behind. She felt a wave of guilt wash over her for invading her daughter's privacy, but she needed answers. She couldn't wait any longer. The bus made its usual stops, picking up children along the way. Nina's eyes stayed fixed on Lisa, who sat near the middle of the bus, her head pressed against the window. She looked small, vulnerable, and alone. Nina's gut twisted as she watched her daughter sit in silence, staring out at the passing streets. The other children on the bus were talking, laughing, but Lisa sat still, isolated in her own world. When the bus arrived at the school, Nina parked across the street and watched as the children filed off. Lisa was one of the last to leave, her shoulders hunched as if trying to make herself invisible. Mr. Harris, the bus driver, watched her with an unsettling look in his eyes. It wasn't obvious to anyone not paying attention, but Nina saw it, the brief flash of disdain in his expression as Lisa passed him. Her heart raced. There was something sinister in the way he looked at her daughter. As the bus pulled away and Lisa disappeared into the school, Nina sat in her car, her mind spinning. She had seen enough to confirm her worst fears. Something was happening between Mr. Harris and Lisa, and it wasn't good. But what could she do? She couldn't accuse the bus driver without proof, and Lisa still wasn't talking. But one thing was certain. Nina wasn't going to stand by and do nothing. Not anymore. The next day, Nina followed the bus again, determined to find more answers. This time, she stayed longer at the school, watching the bus driver's interactions with the other children as they got on and off. Most of the kids received a polite nod or a smile, but with Lisa, it was different. Mr. Harris barely acknowledged the other children when Lisa was near. His attention always fixated on her, his expression cold and detached. Nina's stomach churned as she watched the pattern repeat itself over and over. She began to notice other things, too. The way Mr. Harris's body language shifted whenever Lisa was near, how he seemed to go out of his way to make her uncomfortable. It wasn't overt, but it was there, hidden beneath the surface, in the small, insidious gestures. Nina's hands shook as she realized the full extent of what was happening. This wasn't just bullying. It was something far more malicious. That night, Nina sat on the edge of Lisa's bed as her daughter lay curled under the blankets, her back turned. Lisa, Nina whispered softly, brushing a strand of hair from her daughter's face. I know something is going on with Mr. Harris. I saw the way he looks at you. Lisa flinched at the mention of his name, her body tensing under the covers. Nina's heart broke as she saw the fear in her daughter's eyes, the fear she had been trying so hard to hide. He, he doesn't like me, Mom, Lisa finally whispered, her voice trembling. He, he says things, things about people like us. Nina felt a surge of anger rise in her chest, but she forced herself to stay calm. What kind of things, baby? she asked gently, her voice barely above a whisper. Lisa's lower lip trembled as she spoke. He calls me names, says I don't belong here, that people like me shouldn't be in this neighborhood. Nina's breath caught in her throat. The truth was out, and it was worse than she had imagined. The revelation hit Nina like a punch to the gut. Racism. That's what her daughter had been enduring, day after day, in silence. As Lisa lay there, her small body trembling with fear, Nina's heart filled with rage and sadness. How could this have been happening right in front of her? How could she have missed the signs for so long? She pulled Lisa into her arms, holding her tightly. I'm so sorry, baby, she whispered. 
I'm so, so sorry. Lisa buried her face in her mother's chest, her tears soaking through Nina's shirt. Why didn't you tell me sooner? Nina asked softly, stroking her daughter's hair. Lisa sniffled, her voice muffled against her mother's chest. I was scared, Mom. He said no one would believe me. He said, he said I should just keep quiet. Nina's anger flared at the thought of her daughter being threatened and silenced by someone who was supposed to keep her safe. We're not going to keep quiet anymore, Nina said firmly, pulling back to look into her daughter's eyes. What he's doing is wrong, Lisa, and we're going to stop him. I'm going to make sure he never hurts you again. Lisa looked up at her mother, her eyes filled with both hope and fear. What if no one believes us? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Nina's heart ached at the uncertainty in her daughter's voice. They'll believe us, Nina said, her voice strong and steady. And even if they don't, we'll make them listen. We won't stop until they hear us. With those words, Nina made a silent promise to herself. She would do whatever it took to protect her daughter and to expose the truth. No matter how hard it would be, no matter how many walls she had to break down, she would not stop until justice was served. The next morning, Nina woke up with a clear sense of purpose. The weight of what Lisa had revealed the night before still pressed heavily on her heart, but there was no time to hesitate. She couldn't allow another day to pass with Lisa silently suffering at the hands of Mr. Harris. After dropping Lisa at the bus stop, Nina immediately called the school, requesting a meeting with the principal. The school had to know what was happening, and she was determined to confront them head on. When she arrived at the school, Nina's heart was pounding, but she kept her composure as she walked through the office doors. The principal, Mrs. Turner, greeted her with a warm smile, but Nina could see the tension behind her eyes. They sat down in Mrs. Turner's office, and Nina wasted no time getting to the point. My daughter has been experiencing racial abuse from your bus driver, Mr. Harris, Nina said, her voice steady but filled with emotion. She's been terrified for weeks, and it needs to stop. Mrs. Turner's smile faltered as she leaned back in her chair, her expression growing more serious. I'm very sorry to hear that, Mrs. Johnson, she said, carefully choosing her words. But Mr. Harris has been with us for years. He's a trusted employee. Are you sure there hasn't been a misunderstanding? Nina's hands tightened into fists in her lap, her anger simmering beneath the surface. This is not a misunderstanding, she said firmly. My daughter is being targeted because of the color of her skin, and it's your responsibility to make sure she is safe. The principal sighed, glancing down at the papers on her desk. Of course, we take these kinds of accusations seriously, she said, her voice calm but detached. I'll look into it, but these are serious allegations. It's important that we handle this delicately. Nina felt a rush of frustration. Mrs. Turner's words were careful, but there was no urgency in her tone. It was as if Lisa's pain was just another inconvenience to be managed. But Nina wasn't leaving until something was done. As the meeting continued, Nina quickly realized that Mrs. Turner wasn't going to act as decisively as she had hoped. I understand this is difficult, Mrs. Turner said, her voice maintaining that same detached tone. But without concrete evidence, it's hard to take immediate action. Mr. Harris has been a part of this community for a long time and no one has ever raised a complaint about him before. Nina's stomach churned. This wasn't just about Lisa's word against Mr. Harris. It was about the inherent bias that allowed this kind of abuse to go unnoticed. Nina leaned forward, her voice low but unwavering. Are you saying you don't believe my daughter? Mrs. Turner shook her head quickly, her hands raised defensively. No, no, that's not what I'm saying at all but we need to be thorough in our investigation. We need to talk to other students, gather more information before we can make any decisions. Nina's frustration boiled over. How many other students need to be hurt before you take this seriously? She snapped. My daughter is terrified to ride the bus, and you're telling me we need to wait? Mrs. Turner sighed again, her expression softening. I promise you, Mrs. Johnson, we will look into this. I'll speak with Mr. Harris and the students on the bus. But until we have more information, I can't just remove him from his position. Nina felt a sharp pang of helplessness. She had come here hoping for immediate action, but instead, she was being met with bureaucracy and caution. It wasn't enough, not for Lisa. 
Standing up, Nina gathered her things, her voice tight with anger as she spoke. I hope you understand what's at stake here, Mrs. Turner. This isn't just about one incident. This is about protecting every child in this school from someone who is supposed to be keeping them safe. If you don't act, I will. Mrs. Turner's face hardened slightly, but she remained composed. We'll be in touch, she said. But as Nina left the office, she knew deep down that the school wouldn't take this seriously, not unless she forced them to. After the frustrating meeting with Mrs. Turner, Nina realized she couldn't fight this battle alone. She needed allies, people who would stand with her and help expose what was happening. The school wasn't going to act quickly, so Nina turned to the only other people who might understand, the parents. She remembered seeing other black families in the neighborhood though their interactions had been limited. If Lisa wasn't the only one being targeted, maybe their children had faced similar treatment. That evening, Nina made phone calls to the parents she had met in passing, explaining what Lisa had been going through. To her surprise, she wasn't met with disbelief. Several parents shared their own concerns, stories of strange behavior from Mr. Harris that they hadn't put together until now. I've noticed that he never smiles at our kids the way he does at the others one mother said quietly. I thought I was imagining it, but now I'm not so sure. Another parent, Mrs. Williams, revealed that her son had been moved to the back of the bus several times for no apparent reason. He told me it didn't feel right, but I didn't think much of it at the time, Mrs. Williams admitted, her voice laced with guilt. I should have paid more attention. Nina felt a surge of hope. The more she spoke with these parents, the clearer it became that Lisa wasn't alone. Other children had experienced the same quiet discrimination, and now it was time to bring it to light. They decided to meet in person that weekend, a small group of concerned parents who were ready to take action. As Nina hung up the phone, she felt a renewed sense of determination. She wasn't just fighting for Lisa anymore. She was fighting for every child who had been made to feel like they didn't belong. And with these parents by her side, she knew they could force the school to listen. That weekend, Nina and the other parents gathered at her home. The mood was tense but filled with a sense of urgency. As they sat around the kitchen table one by one, the parents began to share their experiences. Some had noticed small things like cold stares from Mr. Harris or their children being isolated at the back of the bus. Others, like Nina, had sensed that something was deeply wrong but hadn't known how to act on it. I should have said something earlier, Mrs. Williams admitted, her voice heavy with guilt. My son told me about the comments Mr. Harris made, but I didn't want to believe it. I thought it would go away if we ignored it. Another mother, Mrs. Green, nodded in agreement. We've been dealing with this for a while, too. But every time we tried to speak up, it felt like no one wanted to listen, like they didn't want to believe us. The pain in their voices was palpable. As the conversation continued, the weight of the silence they had all endured became clear. This wasn't just about Lisa. It was about a pattern of behavior that had been allowed to continue for far too long. The school hadn't taken action because no one had been brave enough to come forward. But now, together, they had the strength to fight back. Nina listened, her heart aching for these families, but also feeling a growing sense of resolve. Finally, it was Lisa's turn to speak. She sat quietly beside her mother, her eyes downcast as the other parents shared their stories. Lisa, Nina said softly, squeezing her daughter's hand. Do you want to say anything? Lisa hesitated, her small body tense with fear. But then after a long moment, she looked up at the group, her voice barely a whisper. He, he made me feel like I don't belong here, she said, her voice trembling. Like I'm not wanted. The room fell silent as the weight of her words hung in the air. After the meeting with the other parents, Nina felt a renewed sense of purpose. Together, they had a plan. They would bring their concerns directly to the school board. It was clear that the principal wasn't going to act unless pressured, and the parents agreed that their children deserved to feel safe and respected. But as Nina and the others began speaking more openly about the issues with Mr. Harris, they encountered something they hadn't expected, resistance from the community. As word of their accusations spread, the neighborhood, once polite but distant, became openly cold. People who had previously offered small smiles now avoided eye contact entirely. At the bus stop, the other parents huddled together, whispering, 
throwing quick, disapproving glances at Nina and the other black families. It wasn't just indifference. It was a defensive reaction, as if the community was circling the wagons to protect one of their own. One morning, as Nina stood waiting for the bus with Lisa, she overheard a conversation between two mothers nearby. I can't believe they're trying to ruin Mr. Harris's life like this, one woman said, her voice dripping with indignation. He's been driving that bus for years without a single complaint. Now these people move in, and suddenly there's a problem? Nina's heart pounded as she listened, her jaw tightening in anger. These people. The words echoed in her mind, a stark reminder that they were seen as outsiders. Lisa, standing beside her mother, squeezed Nina's hand tightly. She had heard it too. Nina knelt down and kissed her daughter on the forehead. Don't listen to them, sweetie, she whispered. We're doing the right thing. But as the days went on, the cold shoulder from the community only grew more intense. What had once been passive exclusion now felt like outright hostility. The battle wasn't just about Mr. Harris anymore. It was about standing up against a community that didn't want to face its own prejudices. Despite the growing tension, Nina refused to back down, but the fight was taking its toll. At home, Malcolm tried to reassure her, though he too was beginning to feel the weight of the situation. Maybe we should just move on, Nina, he suggested one evening, rubbing his tired eyes. This neighborhood, these people, they don't want to change. We can't win this fight. Nina shook her head, her voice firm but filled with exhaustion. I'm not giving up, Malcolm, not when Lisa's going through this. But even as Nina held her ground, she felt increasingly isolated. The other parents who had initially stood with her were starting to waver. Mrs. Williams stopped returning her calls, and the group meetings they had once held fell apart as parents began to worry about their reputations within the community. I don't want to cause any trouble, one parent said apologetically when Nina confronted her. You know how things are around here. If we push too hard, they'll turn against us. It was a painful realization for Nina. The unity she had hoped for was dissolving under the pressure of social fear and the desire for acceptance. As the days passed, she found herself standing more and more alone. Even Malcolm, though supportive, was growing distant. He was tired of fighting a battle that seemed impossible to win. We're not going to change their minds, Nina, he said one night, his voice weary. And I'm worried about what this is doing to us, to you. But Nina couldn't let it go. Every time she saw Lisa's face, every time she watched her daughter board that bus with fear in her eyes, she knew she had to keep fighting. It didn't matter if the community turned against her. It didn't matter if she was standing alone. She had promised Lisa she would protect her, and she intended to keep that promise no matter the cost. As Nina continued her fight, she started digging deeper into Mr. Harris's past. She reached out to other families who had lived in the neighborhood longer quietly asking if they had ever noticed anything unusual about the bus driver. Most brushed her off, either unwilling to engage or firmly standing by Mr. Harris's reputation as a good man. But then, one afternoon, she received a phone call that changed everything. It was from a woman named Claire, a mother whose children had ridden Mr. Harris's bus years ago. Claire explained that her family had moved out of the neighborhood several years back, but she had heard about what Nina was doing through a mutual acquaintance. I didn't want to say anything at the time, Claire admitted, her voice tinged with guilt. But I noticed things too. My son used to come home upset, saying Mr. Harris would make comments to him, subtle things, but they always made him feel different, like he didn't belong. Nina's heart raced as she listened. Why didn't you say anything? She asked, though she already knew the answer. Claire sighed on the other end of the line. We were new to the area, and I didn't want to cause trouble. I thought maybe we were overreacting. But now I regret not speaking up. Maybe if I had, your daughter wouldn't be going through this. Nina thanked Claire for her honesty, though the anger bubbling inside her was hard to contain. This pattern of silence, of fear of speaking out, was what had allowed Mr. Harris to continue for so long. With this new information, Nina felt more determined than ever. It wasn't just about Lisa anymore. There had been other children before her, children who had quietly endured Mr. Harris's behavior without ever having their voices heard. Nina knew she needed to take this fight to the next level, to force the school and the community to confront what had been hiding in plain sight for years. 
The tension in the community continued to rise as Nina pushed forward with her campaign. She brought Claire's testimony to Mrs. Turner, the principal, and demanded a formal investigation into Mr. Harris. But the school's response was lukewarm, at best. We'll take everything into consideration, Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Turner had said, her tone still dripping with caution and skepticism. But these are serious accusations, and we have to be careful before making any decisions. Nina could feel the frustration gnawing at her. Why was it so hard to get people to believe that something was wrong? Why were they so resistant to seeing what was right in front of them? As she continued to gather evidence, speaking to more families and collecting stories, the tension in the neighborhood only deepened. The whispers about her and her family grew louder. The cold stares turned into outright hostility. One evening, as she and Malcolm were returning home from the grocery store, they noticed a group of neighbors gathered near their front yard, talking in hushed voices. When Nina approached, the conversation stopped abruptly and the group dispersed without a word. She felt the weight of their judgment, the unspoken accusation that she was the one causing trouble, that she was the one disrupting their peaceful lives. At home, Malcolm paced the living room, his hands clenched into fists. I'm tired of this, Nina, he said, his voice rising in frustration. I'm tired of feeling like we're the enemies here, like we're the ones doing something wrong. Nina sat down, her own anger simmering. I know, Malcolm, but we can't stop now, not when we're this close. But even as she said the words, she felt the strain of the fight weighing heavily on her shoulders. How much longer could they keep going, with the whole community seemingly against them? It was early morning when Nina received a call from one of the parents who had been supporting her. You need to come to the school, the voice on the other end said urgently. Mr. Harris is there, talking to Mrs. Turner. Nina felt her pulse quicken as she grabbed her car keys and rushed out the door. She knew this moment would come. A confrontation with the man who had been tormenting her daughter and so many others. When she arrived at the school, the tension was palpable. Parents were gathered near the entrance, murmuring among themselves. As Nina made her way through the crowd, she could see Mr. Harris standing in the principal's office, his arms crossed, his expression calm but defiant. Mrs. Turner sat across from him, her face unreadable. Nina steeled herself and entered the office, her heart pounding in her chest. Mrs. Johnson, this is highly unusual, Mrs. Turner said as Nina walked in uninvited, but Nina didn't care. She fixed her eyes on Mr. Harris, her voice calm but filled with righteous anger. You've been making my daughter's life a living hell, she said, her voice trembling with the weight of weeks of frustration and pain. And I'm here to make sure that stops today. Mr. Harris didn't flinch. He looked at her with a cold, dismissive smile. I don't know what you think you're talking about, he replied smoothly. I treat all the kids the same. Nina's fists clenched at her sides, but she refused to be intimidated. You've been targeting my daughter because of the color of her skin, she said, her voice growing louder with each word. And not just her. There are other parents, other children who've gone through the same thing. Mrs. Turner stood up, raising her hands in an attempt to de-escalate the situation. We're still in the process of investigating these allegations, Mrs. Johnson. We need to handle this carefully. But Nina was done waiting. No more investigations, no more waiting, she said, her voice steady with conviction. This ends now. After the confrontation with Mr. Harris, Nina expected immediate action from the school. But days passed and nothing changed. Mr. Harris was still driving the bus, and Lisa still returned home each day with the same quiet fear in her eyes. Frustration gnawed at Nina's heart. How could they allow this man to continue working, knowing what he had done? The system seemed to be protecting him, not her daughter. Nina reached out to Mrs. Turner again, demanding an update on the investigation, but her calls went unanswered. When she finally managed to speak to someone in the school administration, she was met with vague reassurances that the situation was being handled. It was the same wall of silence she had encountered before, but this time it felt even more impenetrable. They were stalling, hoping the problem would go away. Desperate, Nina took her concerns to the school board, filing a formal complaint. But even there, she encountered resistance. The board members, most of whom had been part of the community for decades, seemed more interested in protecting the school's reputation than in addressing the real issue. We understand your concerns, Mrs. Johnson, 
one of the board members said during a meeting. But without concrete evidence, it's hard to take action against a long-standing employee like Mr. Harris. Nina felt her blood boil. Concrete evidence, she repeated, her voice incredulous. My daughter has been living in fear for weeks. I have testimonies from other parents, from other children. How much more evidence do you need? But the board's response was cold and bureaucratic. They were content to let the system protect itself, leaving Nina and Lisa to fight this battle alone. As Nina left the meeting, she realized that the only way to break through this wall of silence would be to make the story impossible to ignore. At home, the tension between Nina and Malcolm had reached its peak. Malcolm had always supported her, but the weight of the fight was starting to wear on him. That evening, as they sat in the living room, the silence between them was thick with unspoken frustrations. Finally, Malcolm broke the silence, his voice low and tired. Nina, I don't know how much longer we can keep doing this. Nina looked up at him, her heart sinking. What do you mean? She asked, though she already knew. Malcolm sighed, rubbing his hands over his face. I mean, maybe it's time we consider moving. I know you want to fight this, but Lisa's been through so much already. I don't know if it's worth putting her through even more. His words hit Nina like a punch to the gut. She had been fighting so hard for justice, for her daughter's safety. But now even Malcolm was questioning whether it was all worth it. How can you say that? Nina asked, her voice trembling with emotion. We can't just run away. If we leave, we're letting them win. We're letting Mr. Harris and this whole system get away with what they've done to Lisa and to all the other kids. Malcolm shook his head, his expression pained. I know, Nina. I know. But I'm worried about what this is doing to us, to our family. You've been so focused on this fight that sometimes it feels like you're not here anymore. Nina's throat tightened as tears filled her eyes. She had been so consumed by her determination to protect Lisa that she hadn't realized how much it was affecting Malcolm or their relationship. But how could she stop now? How could she walk away when she was so close to exposing the truth? I can't give up, Malcolm, she whispered, her voice thick with emotion. Not now. Not when we're so close. Nina knew that the system wouldn't change unless she forced it to. The school, the principal, the school board, they were all trying to sweep the issue under the rug. If she wanted justice for Lisa, she needed to make their story public. She decided to reach out to the local media, hoping that once the public knew what was happening, the school would have no choice but to take action. The first journalist Nina contacted was sympathetic but cautious. This is a serious allegation, the reporter said over the phone. We would need concrete proof to publish a story like this. Nina felt her frustration rise again. I have proof, she insisted. I have testimonies from other parents, from other kids who've experienced the same thing. My daughter has been living in fear for weeks, and the school has done nothing. The reporter hesitated, but after a long pause, they agreed to meet. That weekend, Nina sat down with the reporter and shared everything. She showed them the written testimonies, the detailed accounts from Lisa and the other children. As she spoke, she could see the disbelief and outrage growing on the reporter's face. This is bigger than just one bus driver, Nina said, her voice firm. This is about a system that's allowed someone like Mr. Harris to get away with this for years. The school doesn't want to admit it, but this is happening right under their noses. By the end of the meeting, the reporter promised to look into it further. Nina felt a flicker of hope. If the story made it to the news, the school wouldn't be able to ignore it anymore. It would force them to act. As she left the interview, Nina knew that the hardest part was yet to come. Once the story broke, the community's reaction would be unpredictable. But she was ready. She had been fighting too long to back down now. A few days after the meeting with the journalist, the article was published. The headline was bold and impossible to ignore. Local school under fire for alleged racial discrimination by longtime bus driver. The article detailed Lisa's story and included testimonies from other parents who had experienced similar issues with Mr. Harris. It was a damning piece that painted a clear picture of negligence on the part of the school and the system that had allowed this to continue for so long. The reaction from the community was immediate. Parents, teachers, and even students were talking about the article, sharing it on social media, 
and discussing it in coffee shops and at the school gate. Some were outraged, expressing their support for the Johnson family and condemning the school's lack of action. Others, however, were defensive, insisting that Mr. Harris was a good man and that the allegations were an attack on his character. But the most important change came from the parents who had previously stayed silent. Seeing the story in the newspaper gave them the courage to speak up. Nina began receiving phone calls from parents she hadn't heard from in months, parents who had once been hesitant to get involved but now felt emboldened by the public attention. We're with you, one mother said over the phone. It's time the school listens to us. We're not letting them ignore this anymore. With this newfound support, Nina organized a meeting with the parents, gathering them together to discuss the next steps. They decided to present a united front at the next school board meeting, demanding that Mr. Harris be removed from his position and that the school take immediate action to address the racial discrimination that had been allowed to fester. As the group came together, Nina felt a renewed sense of strength. She was no longer standing alone. The community silence had been broken. The school board meeting was packed. Parents, teachers, and even members of the press filled the room, waiting for the confrontation that had been brewing for weeks. Nina sat near the front, surrounded by the group of parents who had rallied to her cause. The tension in the room was palpable, the air thick with anticipation. Mr. Harris had been temporarily removed from his position after the article was published, but Nina knew this wasn't the end. They needed to make it permanent. They needed real justice. As the meeting began, the board tried to maintain control, but the room was buzzing with conversations and side glances. When the time came for public comments, Nina stood up, her hands trembling slightly, but her voice strong. My daughter has suffered for weeks because of the actions of a man who was supposed to protect her, she began, her eyes sweeping the room. And she is not the only one. Other children, other families, have experienced the same discrimination, the same fear. We are here today to demand that the school board take action, not just to remove Mr. Harris, but to ensure that this never happens again. There were murmurs of agreement from the parents seated behind her. Nina continued her voice filled with the weight of everything she had carried for so long. This isn't just about one bus driver. This is about a system that has allowed this behavior to go unchecked. The school has a responsibility to protect every child, no matter their race or background. And until real change is made, we will not stop fighting. The board members exchanged uneasy glances as Nina sat back down. After a few moments of awkward silence, one of the board members spoke up. We understand your concerns, Mrs. Johnson, he said, his voice carefully measured. And we want to assure you that we are taking this matter seriously. However, these are serious allegations, and we need to follow due process before making any decisions about Mr. Harris's future with the school. The room erupted in frustration. Parents began shouting, demanding immediate action. Nina felt the pressure building around here, the weight of everyone's anger and pain pressing down on her but she remained calm, determined to see this through. They had come too far to let the board sidestep the issue now. The days following the school board meeting were a blur of meetings, phone calls, and tense conversations. The school had agreed to temporarily suspend Mr. Harris, pending a full investigation, but Nina knew that wasn't enough. She couldn't shake the feeling that the system was still trying to protect him, that they were hoping the media attention would fade and the situation would quietly resolve itself. But Nina wasn't going to let that happen. Every day she balanced her job, her family, and the growing fight for justice. She spent hours on the phone with other parents, coordinating their efforts, making sure no one backed down. At night, when Lisa was asleep, Nina would sit in the living room, exhausted but unable to rest. She thought about the years of silence that had allowed someone like Mr. Harris to operate without consequence. She thought about her daughter, who had bravely spoken up despite her fear. And she thought about the countless children who had faced discrimination, their voices unheard. Malcolm watched her with a mix of admiration and concern. One evening, as she sat on the couch, going over notes for the next school board meeting, Malcolm sat down beside her. You're incredible, you know that, he said softly, his eyes filled with both pride and worry. But I'm worried about you. You've been caring so much. Nina looked up at him, 
her eyes tired but determined. I have to do this, Malcolm, she said. For Lisa. For all the kids who've been hurt by this. He nodded, taking her hand in his. I know, and I'm with you, no matter what. But don't forget to take care of yourself, too. Nina smiled weakly, leaning into his shoulder. She knew he was right. The fight had consumed her, but she couldn't stop now. Not when they were so close. She just hoped that, in the end, it would all be worth it. As the weeks went on, the tension in the neighborhood continued to escalate. Nina had become a symbol of the fight for justice. And while some parents supported her, others saw her as the person who was tearing the community apart. She had received anonymous notes in her mailbox, telling her to let it go or accusing her of trying to destroy a good man's life. The whispers behind her back grew louder and the stares at the grocery store became more hostile. One afternoon, as Nina and Lisa were walking home from school, a neighbor she had known for years stopped her in the street. I don't understand why you're doing this, the woman said, her voice sharp. Mr. Harris has been nothing but kind to my children. I think you're overreacting. Nina stood there, her daughter's hand in hers, feeling a wave of anger and exhaustion wash over her. You don't know what it's like, Nina replied, her voice calm but firm. You don't know what he said to my daughter. Just because your experience was different doesn't mean mine isn't real. The woman scoffed, shaking her head. You're just looking for attention, she muttered as she walked away. Lisa squeezed Nina's hand tighter, her eyes wide with fear. Mom, she whispered, her voice small. Why do they hate us? Nina's heart broke at the question. She knelt down to face her daughter, brushing a tear from her cheek. They don't hate us, baby, she said softly. They just don't understand. But that doesn't mean we stop doing what's right. As they continued walking home, Nina couldn't shake the feeling of isolation. She had lost friends, faced hostility, and become a target in her own community. But none of that mattered. What mattered was making sure that Lisa, and every other child like her, never had to face the kind of fear and discrimination they had endured. No matter how difficult it became, Nina knew she had to keep pushing forward. After months of fighting, the school board finally reached a decision. Mr. Harris was officially removed from his position as a bus driver, and the school district issued a statement acknowledging the failures in their system that had allowed racial discrimination to go unchecked. It wasn't a perfect victory. The statement was carefully worded, avoiding direct blame. But it was a step in the right direction. For Nina, it was the culmination of everything she had fought for. When she told Lisa the news, her daughter's eyes lit up with relief. He's really gone? Lisa asked, her voice trembling with emotion. He won't hurt anyone else? Nina nodded, pulling her daughter into a tight hug. He's gone, baby. You're safe now. The weight that had been pressing down on both of them for so long finally began to lift. For the first time in months, Nina saw the spark return to Lisa's eyes, the fear replaced by hope. The victory didn't come without consequences, though. The community remained divided, and while some parents thanked Nina for her courage, others continued to avoid her. The whispers hadn't stopped, and the tension lingered in the air. But Nina had learned to block out the noise. She had done what needed to be done, and she had no regrets. Malcolm, too, felt the shift in their lives. He had been hesitant at first, unsure of whether the fight was worth it. But now, seeing Lisa smile again, seeing the weight lifted from his wife's shoulders, he knew they had made the right choice. You were right, he told Nina one night, as they sat together on the porch, watching the sun set over their quiet street. It was worth it. Nina smiled, leaning her head on his shoulder. We did it, she said softly. All of us. As the weeks passed, life slowly returned to normal. Lisa started taking the bus again, though this time with a new driver, a kind, middle-aged woman who always greeted the children with a warm smile. Lisa no longer hesitated at the bus stop. She no longer looked back with fear in her eyes. Nina watched her daughter walk confidently to the bus, her backpack bouncing as she climbed the steps, and felt a sense of peace that had been missing for so long. The scars of the battle they had fought would always remain, but Nina knew they had emerged stronger. The neighborhood might never fully accept them, but Nina no longer cared. She had found strength in the fight, a strength that had always been there, but had only revealed itself when it was most needed. 
She had learned that standing up for what was right wasn't always easy, but it was always necessary. One afternoon, as Nina was sitting on the porch, sipping her coffee, she noticed Mrs. Williams walking by. The woman hesitated for a moment, then turned and walked up the steps. I just wanted to say thank you, she said, her voice quiet but sincere, for everything you did. I should have done more, should have been there from the start, but thank you. Nina smiled, nodding. We all did what we could, she replied, and now our kids are safer because of it. As Lisa returned home from school that day, laughing with her friends, Nina felt a sense of calm settle over her. The road ahead was still uncertain, but they had come through the storm together. And whatever challenges lay ahead, Nina knew they would face them as a family. Together, they had built a new beginning, one filled with hope, courage, and the quiet strength that comes from standing up for what is right.